Well, welcome back everyone to 11.2, where we're gonna add a third variable, which means we have to er, add a third equation. All right, so as you can see here, I put some notes that you can pause and read through. I'm not gonna read it to you, but basically what we're doing is building off of the previous by just adding another variable. And you guys know the secret sauce to math is we have to get it down to one equation with just one unknown. And for those reasons, we're going to have to use some of those things that we talked about previously in 11.1. .1. When there was two equations and two unknowns, we learned two different techniques. Technically three, but we said graphing was not a good one. It was very difficult to find the exact answers. So we learned substitution and elimination. Okay. And we found that X or that Y in that one equation with one variable and then plugged it into one of the other ones to find the other. Okay, and we called that an ordered pair because there was an X and a Y and we put them in the order of the alphabet pair because there's two. Well, now our answer, because there's gonna be three variables is going to yield what is called an ordered triple, all right? So instead of just X comma Y, now we'll add a third variable and you probably guessed it. Most of the time it's going to be Z. Okay, so if you wanted to kind of visualize, you knew when we did this, when we had a line, it was pretty easy. Another line, wherever they crossed, that X comma Y was the point of intersection that worked for both this line and that line. Well, now we're talking about a third dimension, okay, a third plane. So if you are in a room that has say an example where three walls meet, okay? You can probably see and visualize three lines. And if you can see where all three of those lines meet, because now we're in 3D, all right? Normally I'd make a joke because I can see all of your faces, but I can't hear, so the joke doesn't work. But usually there's somebody that has glasses on and I'll say, oh, thanks for bringing your 3D glasses because now we're adding that third dimension. Instead of just an X and a Y, now we have the Z axis shooting straight out to us or into the screen, okay? So we're definitely not graphing these, okay? We didn't even graph when it was an X and a Y 2D. We're definitely not graphing with three. So the nice thing is we will still have those two algebraic methods of substitution and elimination, sometimes called the addition method, okay? So even though these are quote unquote new, all right, it's still the goal of getting it from now three by three or three equations, three unknowns down to two equations with two unknowns so that we can eventually get it down to one equation with one unknown. And then we will do what is called back substitution. Okay. Once we find any one of those, the X, the Y, or the Z, we'll plug it into one of our two equations that had two variables, because then we'll know one of them, and we can find the other. And then when we know two of those, we'll be able to finally plug it into one of our original three equations with three unknowns, and by plugging in two of them, we'll be able to find that third. Just remember, don't write your answer in the order that you found them. You're going to write them in order of the alphabet. Okay, so not a whole lot new here. Here's the visual I was trying to get you guys to see. All right, if you looked to a corner, you have a line here, a line here, and then another line there. And you can see it's still gonna be that point of intersection we're looking at. And unfortunately, there's still issues. Those no solutions or infinite solutions that a lot of you guys were doing correctly on the last group quiz, so well done. Okay, some of you guys just put infinite amount of solutions. But remember, just telling us there's a lot of solutions isn't enough. Some of you guys put all reals. That's not true. So be careful. Um, it's only on that specific line that they would match up. And so here are the different scenarios, different looks as to what can be a possibility. What's going to happen most of the time? One point of intersection. 
Okay, And at that one point, we will give them the X, the Y, and the Z. That works for all three. All right, so here are the special cases, which you guys obviously know. What does that mean? How many solutions would there be if my line is on this, this, and that? What are all three lines? No solution. Yeah, they're parallel and therefore no solution. Okay. But with three, there's a few others that aren't as obvious. Remember, it has to work for all. So just because these two are parallel and this one is not, you can see there's not a point of intersection that would be for all three. And that's what we're looking at. So this would also yield a no solution, as would this scenario. Don't stress about it. We're not going to have the visuals. We're not going to graph, but I want to have you guys at least seeing what we're doing algebraically. Okay? There are even some that give us an infinite amount of solutions, like we said. Okay? But most of the time, it's going to be one. And that's that, that ordered triple instead of an ordered pair at that one point of intersection. Okay? If there's an infinite amount, then we'll have to give them all the possible ways to do that. So it would be X and then our Y in terms of X and then our Z in terms of X, just like we talked about with two, all right? These we like because that yields no solution or what we also say the empty set, okay? Don't worry too much about the Visual, I just wanted to give you guys an idea of what we're going to be dealing with and solving algebraically. Okay, that's pretty much it for the notes. Now, I just wanted to make sure that you guys remember how to do this. And if you want me to go over any one of these, just let me know. I'd be happy to. Using both the substitution method and then another example, doing the addition or elimination method. Okay, we could even just start them and not finish them once we get to a point. It's totally up to you guys how much you want to see. So you can see that there are three different, and they all look different, so I'm going to assume that they're different. Equations here, because there are three different unknowns, and notice we stacked them all up. So substitution, you know, what do you have to do when you're using that method? Substitute. And before we can substitute, I know that was a smart answer, Julian, but what do we have to know in order to substitute? Well, one variable equals. Very good. And your choice, right? It doesn't matter which variable you solve for to then, like Julian said, substitute in. So Barrett, look down the columns and tell me which one variable do you think would be easiest to solve for? Uh, the second equation of z equals. Because it's already almost by itself. Very good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just say, and this is why I like to number them. You can call them A, B, and C, whatever you want. But I know, all right, I'm talking about this equation. And I'm going to take that 2x plus 4y plus z equals 16. And I'm going to solve for z. And that's pretty easy. We can just do basically two steps. But I'm going to do them in one. I'm going to subtract both the 2x and the 4y, because I can, it's an equation. We know that these two sides are equal. So that that and that drop to zero. And my new equation two looks like z equals 16 minus 2x minus 4y. But guys, remember, you can get lost in these things. Remember the goal. Even though we're starting with three equations and three unknowns, we want to get it down to two equations and two unknowns like we had in the previous section, 11.1. Because once we had that, even still, we try to get it down from two and two to one and one. So remember, that's always our goal is to just get one single equation with just one variable because then we know how to do the inverse and find undo everything that's been done to it and find that variable. So now I have a Z. And I got it from equation two. 
So then what am I going to do with that? Plug in one, one variable. Good. Where? Where am I going to plug that in? For Z, one or two, or one or three, I guess. Yeah, very good. To the other two. Okay. Because we can't, and this is why I like to number them or name them, right? We know that that Z is what it has to be equal to. Now, if I knew X and Y, then perfect. I'd know my Z. And remember, we're trying to find an X, Y, and Z that would make every single one of these equations true. That when I plug it in here, here, and here, and work all that out, it gives me negative 15. I plug the same X, Y, and Z here, and it gives me 16. And 20. That's our goal. So guessing and checking is not going to get it done. Right? You got to have an algebraic technique in order to do this. And we just solve for Z. And that Z is going to be the same for all three equations. But remember, we found it using equation two. So we will start by plugging it into equation one, which is 3x minus 4y plus two times a Z equals negative 15. And we knew Z to be 16 minus two X minus four Y. So again, I just substitute in what I knew my Z was. And of course, what do we wanna do with this? Clean it up, simplify. That looks nasty, all right? And how are we gonna do that? We're gonna start by getting rid of that parenthesis by doing the two times our Z. So my equation one now looks like two times 16, which is 32, minus four X minus eight Y still equals my negative 15. But again, we could take that one step further and go ahead and combine our like terms, which gives me a negative X, negative 12y, and then I'm going to go ahead and move that 32 over so that it's equal to negative 47. And if you don't like negative people, hopefully you can make them positive. But in this case, I don't like all those negatives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this whole thing by negative 1. So my new equation 1 looks like a positive x positive 12y equals positive 47. Problem is, it still has an x and a y. I can't solve for, now again, I could solve for x, but then my issue is I'm still gonna have to find what my y is. So I'm gonna pause right there. I'm gonna start over and I'm gonna go back to equation three, which was two x plus three y, plus five Z equals 20. And again, I left a gap where I put Z because I know what Z is always. It's 16 minus two X minus four Y for my equation two. And then from there, we said that we would take this and simplify. So I'm now gonna take this new equation three, which is two X plus three Y, then, Five times 16, you can do in your head because you know what five times 10 is. That's 50. And then five times six is 30. And 50 and 30 together is 80. Okay, you don't have to reach for your calculator. That's too slow. Minus 10x minus 20y equals our 20. And just like before, we will clean that up by combining our like terms. So a 2x, negative 10x gives me negative 8x, 3y minus 20y, negative 7, more negatives, man. It's all this smoke, isn't it? And then those cancel out equals to negative 60. So again, if we wanted to multiply that by a negative, we could. I'm going to go ahead and leave it as my equation 3. You guys will see why in a minute. Because I've used substitution, 
Does that mean I can only use the substitution method? Or can I mix and match? At this point right here, I got my new equation one, my new equation three, where we substituted in our Z, which was in terms of X and Y, to get now two equations with just an X and a Y in them. At this point, you should be going back to your algebra one or 11.1, which we just did last week. And could I use elimination to get rid of either my X's or my Y's at this point? Or could I use substitution again pretty easily by moving this over and now knowing what X is in terms of Y to finally get it down to just one equation with one variable. It's your choice. Okay, I'm not going to tell you guys how to do these. I'm just going to show you the different options that there are. So you tell me, how would you like to continue with that equation one and three? Substitution and plugging it in there or elimination. As you can see, it doesn't matter. You're still going to be left with one equation with just Y in it. So first one to speak up, that's what I'll do. Elimination. Perfect. That means, though, that I'm going to have to take and multiply this whole equation one by a positive eight. So my new equation one is going to be 8x multiplying the 8 over, right? And then 8 times 10 and 2. That's what 12 is, right? Is 80 and 16, so a total of 96 Ys. And then you're looking at this one like, okay, now he's going to use... No, you don't have to use a calculator. You can still do 8 times 40. It's just 4 and then add the 0 on. That's what 40 is, right? A 4 and a 10. So eight times 40 is 320, and then eight times seven is 56. And if you can hold those two numbers in your head in order to add them, you can see that you'd get 376. So this is where it gets its two names. Julian said we're gonna use the elimination, but it's also called the addition method because right now if I say that this side is equal to this side and this side is equal to this side, well, if I add the two things together, then this side added together should still be equal if I add this side together. Okay, so that's where it gets its name, the addition or elimination method. So now I got to take 96 and subtract 17. And just be careful, 96 minus 17. A lot of you are like, oh, I got to borrow. No, you don't. You can still do this in your head. You know 90 minus 10 is just 80. You know 6 minus 7 is negative 1. So therefore, I have what? 79 Ys. Um, you multiply 8 with the number 1 to make it even, right? Yeah, and I'm trying to color coordinate it so that you can follow, right? Yeah, so I was just making sure. I did it in that lime green there. So that you could see. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Yep. And now we're adding these two together. Where that then eliminated, hence its name. And when we added these, we got 79 Ys. This one's a little bit easier to work with because we got 376 and we just need to subtract 60. So the only thing that's going to be in effect are the tens. All right, so we're still going to have the 300. We're still going to have the 6, but that's just going to leave me with 10. So we got 316. And at this point, now you're probably reaching for your calculator, but again, you don't have to because we have a little thing called estimating. I just wanted you to think a little bit, like, what would I use? Well, this is really close to 80. And if we're going up a little bit, then we probably want to raise this up a little bit. And since we're going to the next tens, 
I'm thinking that this is probably like 320. And if I divided this by 80, then I know the tens are going to drop out. And I know that goes in four times. Right. But we've asked if we're moving it up to 80, we've actually lost. If we're doing it four times, we'll lose one four times. Which this 320 actually loses one four times. So we know it actually works perfectly for four. But again, feel free to use your calculator at that point. All right. Divide by 79. And you know that it goes in perfectly. And once you find that first variable, it's all easy from there. Okay, but finding that first variable, as you can see, that's where all the work is. We did all of that just to get this. Okay, but don't get lost. Look how I'm nice, neat, and organized. I'm not saying that you have to get out your kids' crayons or your little brother or sister's colored pencils, right? But it helps. It helps to keep it clean, nice, neat, and organized. Because guess what? You're going to be doing a lot of stuff like this in calculus, right? So you might as well get used to it. So I used substitution at the beginning to get it down to having two equations with the same two unknowns. And then at that point, we switched over to elimination and found our y. Now, what can we find next? X. Very good. Y. Because you have your Y. Good, but why can't I find my Z? Oh, wait. Oh, shoot. Can't you find either? No, you cannot. And here's why. No pun intended. If I plug this in here, which I know that's what Z is equal to, notice we still have another variable. Oh, yeah. But working backwards, okay, taking this Y and plugging it into one of, and this is why I lightly box these. If I plug in Y here, then I can solve for X. If I plug in Y here, then I can solve for X. And which one, <clears throat> which one should I plug it into? Good. Jacob got my joke. Equation one, how come? Again, it doesn't matter. We're still finding the same X, Y, and Z for all three of these, but Y1, trying to solve for X. And this is a lot bigger and uglier than this one is. I already almost have the X by itself, okay? So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna use my equation one again, all right? And I'm gonna say, I know X plus 12 times the Y was equal to 47. And we knew that Y was what? Four. So I plug it in, I multiply those together to get a 48. And you can stop right there and tell me what X would have to be or subtract the 48 over if you don't like thinking and you just like doing and get your negative one, okay? Either way, I'm cool. Hope you guys are too with that. Now and only now, Jose and everyone. Remember, we knew at the very beginning, I told you Z was equal to this for any one of my different equations. They would all be the same X, Y, and Z. So when we chose this one, because it was the easiest to solve for, we knew that that was going to be what Z was in all three. But we needed to know the X and the Y. And it took us a little bit of arm waving just to get one of them. And then we back substituted in that Y to find the other. And now that we have the X and the Y, we can plug those in, simplify it to find our Z. So again, trying to keep it all color coordinated. I'm going to go back to my equation two, which was my Z equals. 16 minus two times my X minus four times my Y. And we knew that the Y, careful, plug it in the proper places, was four. And the X, careful with your signs, was negative one. And now 
clean it all up to get your final answer. Isn't it just two? Careful, negative times negative is gonna be? Positive, I just said two. Yep, and then a negative times a positive here is gonna stay negative. So very good, Jose. The 16s will cancel out and get our Z is equal to two. So how do I finish? What do I put in my answer blank? If it's on a quiz or a test, what do I select? Negative one, four, two. Is that just because that was your favorite order, Barrett? Isn't that the order? It's the order of our alphabet, not the order that we find them in, okay? So very good. Be careful and let me zoom out so that you can see the whole thing together because where can you go wrong? Everywhere. Everywhere. So be nice, neat, and organized. I know some of you have a little bit sloppy handwriting. Try to clean it up, okay? Try to make sure that you're nice and organized at least so that you don't get lost in your own work. Okay. Now you can see why I didn't want to do a lot of these. All right. That's the substitution method. So when I go to this one, I will just start this one. Okay. I won't finish it. I'll show you how to actually do the addition or elimination method from the start. Okay. Let me zoom it back. So we have a little bit larger here and let me name these once more. A, B, and C, one, two, and three. If you already see too many numbers, you're like, I'm gonna just call this A, B, and C. All good, whatever, okay? If I'm gonna eliminate, I get to choose. Is it gonna be the X's, the Y's, or the Z's? And what would I recommend? The Y's. Why? Because you have a positive four line and negative four line. Okay, good. But remember, Barrett, when we're using this addition or elimination method, if you want to take equations one and three and add them to get rid of those, that's still going to leave you with some X's and Z's. It doesn't have to be one and three, does it? I mean, I know three, but it, can you pick either one from one and two? Yes. Okay. But the reason Barrett chose one and three was because when we add those, the Y's would cancel immediately without having to do anything to either equation, which is smart. But I want you to look ahead as well into your futures, which is why you're all here. You're investing in your futures, right? Think about that. If those are the Y's that he's canceling out, he's going to have to choose two others other than one and three to also cancel the Y values because what he was left with was X's and Z's, two variables. And remember, what did I tell you is the big secret in math? We got to get it to one equation with just one variable. So Barrett, I'm totally with you. That's the first thing I saw, but I didn't like the fact that I would have four and three or negative four and three other than using my one and three again. So I may be looking at these and just making one of them negative so that those cancel because then two and three are easier to use than fours and threes there. But I'm thinking actually I like that the best again because I would still have to multiply whether it was those two or these two, I'd still have to multiply both equations by something to get rid of them, to get rid of them. So what I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose Z to eliminate. You guys see that thought process? Does it matter what you choose? No, your choice. You will eliminate the X, the Y, or the Z. Just remember, you're gonna have to do it twice. Okay, because we're trying to get two equations with two variables, just like we did in the previous example. All right. So I'm gonna choose. Uh, equation one, and I'm going to multiply the whole equation one 
by a negative two. So that's gonna give me negative four X, negative eight Y, negative two Z equals negative 32. And I chose that because with equation three as is, three X minus four Y plus two Z and negative 15, when I add those, and I'm gonna call this equation 13 so that you know where it came from, one and three together, then I get negative X minus 12 Y and the Z's cancel out to be a negative 47. Huh, those look familiar. All right, we'll just, we'll keep going, we'll keep going. There's one equation with an X and a Y in it. I need a second equation with X and a Y in it so I can get it to be one equation, one unknown. So why did I choose Z? It looked really nice. And I'm gonna do it again though. I'm gonna use equation one, but this time I'm gonna multiply it by what? Negative five. Very good. Where did Julian get negative five from? He got it from the five Z to make it cancel out with the other option and the only other option since i'm choosing to use this to cancel both equations three z i also have to do it with equation two's z and so i'm just looking at its coefficient the number in front to see what i had to multiply by to get rid of it but remember to keep it equal i got to do it equally to everything to keep it equal okay so again color coordinating that gave me that. Now I'm going to take my equation two. And again, I just like to number them so that I don't get lost. And now I'll add these to get a new equation. I'm going to call equation 12. Why 12? It came from one and two. Okay. Don't need to do that, but I just like to know where these things came from. And at that point right there, you should be able to finish. Because now we have our two equations with the same two unknowns, X and Y. You can use your substitution or elimination just like you did in algebra in high school and even in our review section we did last week, 11.1. Okay? Now again, I, I kind of paused and joked around. This looked familiar. Does this look familiar too? This is the exact same example I did in example one, but it looked different, okay? I'm gonna minimize it so that you can actually see. They are different. Do you see the first one is three X minus four Y plus two Z? My first one here is not that, is it? But if you look at the very bottom, do you see the 3x minus 4y plus 2z equals negative 15? <laughs> I fooled you guys. All I did was rearrange the order. And you all would have done that exact same problem, just in a different technique. And guess what you would have gotten for the answer? Because it's the exact same problem. Okay, there's another reason it wasn't just to fool you or try to get you to think. It's also because of what we're going to be doing at the end of today with these things called matrices. Okay, do you guys all remember our synthetic division? When we were doing the long division with polynomials and we said, man, that's that's not fun. That's a lot. And so we got rid of all the X, Y's and all those things. We just took the not X and Y, excuse me, the X cubes, the X squareds, the X, we just took their coefficients and it was so quick and easy and clean. We're going to try to do something similar to that at the end of today so that we don't have to do all of this. Okay. So if you wanted to finish that one, you already know the answer, but feel free to use either technique 
even if I recommend one on the group quiz, I'm good with you using your favorite. As long as you can go through and show me the work. Okay. I don't want you guys just taking the answers that I give you and then plugging them back into each one of these to check. Okay. That's not going to benefit you in your thought process. Okay. So that's it for that first section. And of course, we're going to just keep adding a little bit more. So 11.3 is systems of nonlinear equations. And then we're going to even add in inequalities. So the good news is, even though we're adding more things, which are not just lines, and these things where they're not just equals, we're going to go back a step. We're going to go back to two variables and two equations. So that's the good news. Okay. The bad news is they're not just going to be lines anymore. And they're not just going to be equations anymore. They're also going to include the less than, the greater than, the less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. And if you guys remember, we still only know how to solve one equation with one variable in it. And if I gave you something like this, you would know exactly what to do. You'd add the three to get 10, you divide by two to get five. And you tell my one and only answer for that equation is five. Nothing else works that would make that true. But guys, what happens when I do this? Now, how many solutions are there? Very good, Alex. Infinite. And where would they be at and from and to? Still add the three. Still divide by two. But this time, it's saying that not only is it equal to five, also anything greater than five would work. And since we only have a single X, we'd only have a single X axis number line. And from zero, we'd go all the way to five and we put that solid dot and we'd say anything to the right or five to infinity in interval notation. You guys remember that? Well, then what if I add a Y in? Remember, just by adding that second variable, it added a second axis. And we graphed all the points on that line that would work. But what if it was an inequality? Now it's harder to see the greater than or less than, right? So how would I tell if it's greater than or less than? Because this is greater for the X, but this is greater for the Y. All we do is, since we have two different halves that we're looking at, for this line, which gives me all the equations, we take that line and we test a point that's not on it. So pick something over here, pick something over here. And I circled that because what is that point right there? Zero, zero. One of my favorites. That's right, Julian, zero, zero. Because we know what happens when we plug in zero for X or Y. It oftentimes zeroes things out. And so it should be a quick, easy check to see whether this is also a solution or not. And I say, or not, because what if it is? Then everything over here is, and we shade that in. But what if it's not? Then we know it's everything on the other side. Okay? So again, that's what we're going to be talking about. If you want to go through and read this, go ahead and pause it. Feel free to read through some of the notes. But remember, we're not just dealing with lines anymore. And we're not dealing with just equations anymore. Okay? But all the things that we've done in the past, both algebraically and geometrically, we're going to have to use. Okay? So let's say we had a circle and a line. And again, we're just going to start with equations first, and then we'll talk about the inequalities. I just gave you a brief little preview. Okay. How many solutions in this scenario? In this scenario, 
in this scenario? Obviously, you can see the answers down here, but again, hopefully you know why. This system of equations, we're looking for all the answers that work for both equations. And if this represents all the solutions to that equation, and this represents all the solutions to that equation, what works for both? Nothing. If this line were what is called, anybody know what it's called when it only hits at one point? Tangent. Ah, very good, Julian. If it's a tangent line to my circle, then there's only one x comma y that would work for both my line and my circle. And how about this? What is that line called when it goes through the circle? A little less known. It's called a secant line. Okay, if it's not a line and it ends at the endpoints, and it goes from one point to the other, that's called a chord. If it goes through the center and it does that, then it's called a diameter. Just throwing a little vocab, a little previous material at you. None of that really matters for us because what are we looking for? We're looking for an X and a Y that works for both. Here only one, here two, here, none. But of course, we learned how to graph more than just lines and circles, didn't we? How about circles and does anybody know what these elongated circles are called? Ellipses. Very good. Excellent, everyone. Ellipses. Okay, or an ellipse, singular. So of course, we're still looking for all the solutions that work for both, right? None, one, two, three, four, for that little devil. Okay. Lots of different options when you have more than just lines involved, okay? So be careful. Do you guys remember how to graph circles, ellipses, hyperbolas, oh my? No, some of you guys didn't even remember how to graph a line, right? Like, oh, y equals mx plus b, slope intercept. Yeah, it's been a while. Some of you guys don't remember algebra two. It's been a long time since you've taken that in high school. So I don't expect you to graph these. Because remember, we didn't even graph lines, which are the easiest things to graph, because it was very difficult to find the exact point where they intersected. So lucky for you, we're not going to graph a lot of these things. There will be some times that we have to graph. And when is that? Inequalities. Because even if you remember how to graph a parabola, and that represents every single solution for that equation, what if I did this, or that, or through the equals as well? You need to know that that means it's either all of this on the outside or all of this on the inside as well. And we can't list all of those because how many solutions will we now have? And that's not a suitable enough answer for most. Hey, what'd you get? A lot. No, you gotta tell me exactly where, what I could actually plug in. What are the solutions to this problem, okay? So hopefully you remember, here's an example graphically for you. And I'm just doing the x squareds, the parabolas that we reviewed, okay? Remember if it's solid or if it's dashed, 
you need to know the difference. This is the same graph for all of these, x squared minus 4. But you can see that there's four different graphs. They all look similar, but they're all different. So if you have a problem and it's this, and it's multiple choice, which one of those is correct? It depends on what is given. So pay attention to details. Okay, when are we going to have the solid lines? Greater than or equal to? Not greater than, not less than, but when it's equal to. Okay, just like if it didn't have that and it was just equal to, that's all we would have drawn. Because that, every single one of these points, x comma y, is where it would be true. It would be equal. Right? Like 0, negative 4 is the easiest one to see. Or 2, 0. Or negative 2, 0. If you plug those things in, you would get exactly the same thing on the other side. But this one also wants where they're greater. Or where it's less. And remember, how are we going to figure out where it's greater or where it's less? Because there's both an X and a Y involved, what are we going to have to do? Put in two points. One's good enough. Just plug in one point. And what is one of our favorite points? Origin. The origin. Very good. Zero, zero. And if you plug in zero here, it zeroes it out even when you square it. And zero there. But remember, you still have this minus four. So is zero less than or equal to a negative four? No, that is not true, which means we shade the other side. See how this works? Is zero when I square it still zero minus four? Zero for my y for this point? Is zero greater than or equal to negative four, though? And remember, we're not even worried about the equal to. We already drew that in solid because of that. But we're looking where it's greater. And that, this time, is true, so we would shade the inside. And, guys, that's good enough for me, the way that I've done it. You don't have to get out your shade sticks or go buy anything on Amazon, okay? Just good enough, okay? Just let me know you know where it's at. And, again, that's by testing a point. Okay, so I say strap in because if you don't remember how to graph some of these conic sections, like parabolas, ellipses, circles, even maybe a hyperbola, you may have to go back and review some stuff. Okay, fill in some of those prereq gaps. But for us, when we see equals, that's a good thing because they want to know exactly equal to what so i'm not going to tell you how to solve these all the time i'm just going to tell you to solve because i don't want to give you too many hints i want you to think for yourself but in this one i'm telling you to use substitution method my point is could you even use the elimination method on this one No. Very good. No, you could not. And here's why. Even if you multiplied this whole thing by a negative and tried to add the left side with the right side, x squared minus x does not cancel out. That's not zero. When you look at these, they have to be the same thing in order to add or subtract to get them to be a zero and cancel out. Does that make sense? You have to know when to use what. You don't even have the option, even if elimination is your favorite, which is typically mine. Right? You can't use it on this. So I'm looking, what do I want to solve for? The X or the Y so that I can substitute it into my other equation? Which equation, which variable? Second equation for X. Very good, David. That should be obvious to everyone. It's already almost by itself. All I'm going to have to do is 
add 3y to both sides. So I get my new equation to is x equals the y's cancel out. So I'll do it lightly here. And we get 3y minus 10 on the other side. One of the biggest mistakes, you guys, and I probably would liken it to the last section, not so much this one, when we had three equations, three unknowns, people will solve. They won't label. They'll just do it. They're like, ah, I don't need that. I know what I'm doing. They will solve one equation for X. And then they go back and they look and they're like, oh, dang, I don't, I don't really want to plug that into the top equation. You know what? I'll just plug this into this equation. It's the same equation. You can't just sit there and plug it back in to what it already is in a different form. You're going to get raw things. And unfortunately, you're going to say, oh, it's no solution or it's an infinite number of solutions that look like this. Okay, be careful with that. All right. Remember, we're dealing with a circle and a line. And we talked about the different scenarios that it could be zero, one or two max, All right? So equation two is what we have there. I will use that in equation one, which is X squared plus Y squared equals 10. And I know X is three Y minus 10. Remember, we're trying to get it down to one equation, one unknown still. And by solving for one of them and substituting it into the other, I now have my one equation with just one variable. But this is where students start messing up. What's my next step? You square it, right? Very good, square what? What is it? Three Y minus 10. Good, which means I just get to square this and that, right? Yep. No, and that's where most okay. people make a mistake. Three okay. Y minus 10 means I have 3y minus 10 times 3y minus 10. If you just square that and square that, you're losing out on some of the pieces, aren't you? Because that's going to give me my 9y squared that you would have gotten. That's going to give me my positive 100 that you would have gotten. But do you see how you're missing the negative 30 there and another negative 30y there? That's what most people miss. And that's a huge mistake all right so be very careful when squaring these things don't just square each piece if there's more than one piece in there you have to expand it if you're afraid that you might be one that makes that mistake then just do what i just did and expand it write it out because then hopefully you'll see Oh, shoot, I got to foil. I got to distribute this 3y to that 3y, the 3y to the negative 10, and then another negative 10 to the 3y. You guys okay with me skipping that and, and not writing negative 30y twice? And then positive 100. And because I have y squareds and y's, what do I have to get this whole thing set equal to? Zero. Very good. And how are we going to do that? Bring the 10 over to subtract. Excellent. Subtract the 10 over. And notice I do have some things that I can combine. I have nine y squareds and I'm adding another y squared. That means I have 10 y squareds minus 60 y's. And then that gives me plus 90. And you're looking at this and you're like, oh, no, there's a leading coefficient. I'm not very good at those. Don't stress. Remember, you can do whatever you want to an equation with things that are known. Unknowns, I can't mess with those. I can't divide them out and get rid of them because I don't know what they are. But if this has a 10 and all of these also are divisible by 10, then guess what I'm going to do? I'm not even going to factor it out. I'm going to divide it out of this entire equation so that that cancels out to just be a y squared minus 6y plus 9 equals 0. 
And from there, our quickest, easiest method is what is called factoring. And if I factor this, then hopefully you know your trinomial factoring by now. Same and both negative would have to be my signs. And I know three times three gives me my positive nine and combines to my negative six in the middle. So actually, I only got how many answers for Y, even though I knew that there could have been two in this equation. You only got one. Yeah, they're both positive three. I'm not going to write it twice then. But I do have to go and find what? X. Cool thing is, here it is. And it already tells me exactly what X is if you know what Y is. So I'll go back up here to that first equation that we dealt with, equation two, and say that X is equal to three Y minus 10. And we knew that that Y was three. So we get nine minus 10, which is negative one. And what do we put in our answer blank? Three, negative one. Sorry, that was supposed to be an X, excuse me. X there. Very good. We're going to put negative one comma three though, not three negative one. Remember it's order of the alphabet, not order that you found it in. Everybody remember all that? It's been a while, right? That's why I'm trying to do some examples more than I've done in the previous because there's really not a whole lot else that you guys need to know. It's just be careful with these little tricks and nuances that a lot of students make mistakes on and they leave out this, which is obviously going to affect your answers. Okay. So if I gave you that one and told you to do it by the addition or elimination method, could we use that this time? Yeah, good. A lot of you put yes in chat. Barrett shaking his head. Because notice they line up as the same thing. The only difference is the coefficient. And we can get them to be the opposites so that they cancel out or eliminate. Could we still use the substitution method on this? What do you think? Very good. Yes, we can. And you don't even have to solve for X or for Y because I don't even have an X or a Y in these other equations. All I got to do is, for example, solve for the Y squared. Because if I know what Y squared is by just subtracting over the X squared, then I can substitute in what I know y squared is to the other. And I still got it down to my one equation with one variable. Okay, so just going to run through this real quick. I'm going to take equation one and leave it as is. 4x squared plus y squared equals 13. And I'm going to take equation two and I'm going to multiply the whole thing. What do you guys want to get rid of? The x's or the y's? What would be easier? Lines. Definitely, because all I'd have to do is multiply by a negative to everything to get those to drop out. Where here it'd have to be by a negative four. Okay, so definitely going to multiply by a negative one to everything. And remember, it doesn't matter what you eliminate, what you solve for to substitute. What matters is that you get it down to one equation, one variable, right? Now I will go ahead and add to eliminate. And I'm left with 3x squared equals 3. So quick, what are my answers? Still need to simplify. How is that? You, have the, you can simplify by the, the threes, and then you have this uh, square. So you have to square root the other side. So you can't tell me what gives me that? On this equation? 
plus or minus one. Ah, dang it, Julian. See, you kind of talked yourself through it. I wanted you guys to answer quickly because what happens when people answer or do things quickly? They oftentimes don't think and they make mistakes. I wanted all of you to see I got three times something and it has to equal three. My answer is one. But don't forget what we call the degree of the equation tells us that there's two possible answers. So do what Julian said. We'll take the x squared equals the one and then and only then I will take the square root. But remember, we took the square root, which means some of you guys are putting it in the chat. Don't forget the plus and minus possibilities. Because what squared gives you one? Well, not just one. It's also a negative one. So that's where the two answers appear, which means, guys, when I go over here, I'm going to have a one comma something, and I'm going to have a what? Negative one comma something, which means now we still need to go back and find our what? Our y's. Thank you, Barrett. So which equation are we going to plug in those x's that we found to find our y's? Two. Absolutely. Because remember, what we are finding are x's and y's that make both of these true. So if I get my choice, I'm definitely using the easiest thing. And in this case, that is definitely equation two. It says you got x squared plus y squared equals 10. And we found x to be. Now you got to do one at a time, pun intended, because our answer is one, right? I'm going to use positive one first. But What's going to happen when I throw in a negative one? What was my first step when it was just positive one here? It's going to be to square it. And what happens when we square positives? They stay positive. What happens when we square negatives? They also become what? Yeah, very good, Barrett. So... Whether I put a positive or a negative one in, look, guys, it looks like I'm going to get the exact same answer. I'm going to get one. And then y squared equals 10. And can you guys see what the answer is going to be here? Plus minus three. Very good. If not, you can always go through the motions of the algebra without doing a whole lot of thinking at this point. But remember, when you take the square root, you have to put the plus and minus, both possibilities. If they just ask you what's the square root of 81, you just give them 9. You don't tell them plus or minus 9. But remember, we're solving an equation. And in order to solve it, get it by itself, we had to take the square root, which means we got to give them both answers. Which means, guys, careful. Go ahead, Julian. Are you cool if we don't show our work on that, that part, if it's, like, pretty simple? Absolutely. Like Yep. Just be careful. I wouldn't recommend doing that on the test, but because you're going to be doing it repetitiously on the homework and group quiz, I'm okay with you skipping a few steps. Just be careful. Okay. And here's why, Julian. Where do I put the positive three? Where do I put the negative three? You have to make two sets of one and negative one. Because remember, when we put in that positive one and squared it, we were going to come up with two answers for y. And when we put in the negative one and squared it, and we also got two answers. So for that one input, for one, we actually got both positive three and negative three. And when we plugged in the negative one, we actually got both positive three and negative three which makes sense because hopefully you recognize that this is a circle and this is a, or in, ellipse. Okay, circle is when the coefficients are both squared, or excuse me, are the same and both X and Y are squared. So if there's a number in front and they're both squared, 
then it's going to be elongated in one direction, either the X or the Y. And if you were to ever take an ellipse and you were to cut it in half and make them face the opposite directions, that, my friends, is called a hyperbola. And do you remember the symbol we use for opposite? Oh, man, I thought I got it home with you guys the other week. What is the opposite of five? Negative. It's this. So if we were to throw a negative, that's when it takes these circle shapes or these elliptical shapes and faces them in opposite directions. That's the hyperbola. Okay. So make sure that you account for all of your answers. And if you wanted to check if they're right, you could always go to like a Desmos or graphing calculator, GeoGebra, and actually plug these things in to make sure that you get the four places where they'd intersect. All right, last one here for this section, then we'll move on. How do we graph inequalities? Now, again, we got to graph them because there's an infinite amount just by making this not equals. So what kind of shape is this so that we know what kind of form to put it in? A parabola. Very good. How do you know it's a parabola? Well, Only one true. of them is squared. Yep. Sorry, Barrett. So that means we want to get it, in this case, the y by itself. So I'll go ahead and add y to both sides. And if you guys are cool with it, I'm going to subtract one to both sides as well, because I just want that Y by itself. So that that and that would cancel out. And I'd have Y with my sign still facing the same direction. And the X squared minus one on the other. Problem is, we just don't like it in this form. We'd rather have these flip flop. See, it makes us happy. So I'm going to go ahead and take and flip flop sides which means I also need to flip-flop my sign because I know that this is open towards the Y. So this is what I'm going to graph. And in order to graph it, I'm going to pretend it's this because you all hopefully should know that Y equals X squared minus one is a parabola now that Barrett mentioned it to us. And it is our standard parabola, Y equals X squared, just shifted what? Down one. Beautiful. Which means I know when I go over one, squared would be up one. And that means either direction, because when we square it, we said that positive and negative would both become a one. When I go over two, when I square it, it would be up one, two, three, four over two, one, two, three, four. And that is enough for me. Oh, 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 shoot. I can't do that yet. I got to go back and think, should I be putting that as a solid U-shaped parabola or should it be dashed? How do we know? Equal. If it's equal, then yes, we would just do like we did. Was ours? Yes. Very good, Julian. So I will take this and I will draw. Sorry, a little earthquake there. My perfect parabola. Now, again, if it wasn't equal to, it did not have this piece and it was strictly greater or strictly less, this all would have been dashed. And those would basically be our border line or border curve like we've been talking about a lot. But how do we tell where all of this stuff is also, now that we got the equal to part, where do we tell where it's greater? Plug in a point. Which point? The origin. Any point that's not on here. We said one of our favorite, very good, is the origin. We're going to test that. Now, you can test it in the original or you can test it into your 
adapted form. It's totally up to you. Okay, just to show you, zero there, zero there. I get zero is greater than or equal to negative one. Is that true? Which means that works and so does everything else inside. Okay, if I plug it in up here into my original one without all of the strikings through it, I get zero squared minus zero is less than or equal to one. Is zero less than or equal to one? Again, you can see it does not matter where you plug it in because this equation and this equation are the same equation, just in a different form. All right? Remember, why are we graphing? It's one of the most important things that you can hopefully get from today. Why are we graphing? What does this show you? All of the solutions for the. Very good. Every single solution for that equation. Okay. Because there's an infinite amount, if you remember. All right. We have to show them. That's why we graph, guys. All right. I'm not going to make you do another one. There's two lines. Make sure that you get them into slope intercept form, graph them, dashed or solid shade and remember if there's two lines say they look like this and one of them you shade this direction the other you shade this direction what would be the only part that i'd want you to shade in the most Be where they cross. Okay, so that's why I was going to even mention this, but I think you guys hopefully remember how to graph two lines, even if they have inequalities. Because we got to keep moving on. A lot to cover today. So, again, if you want to pause it at this point and go ahead and read through it when I post this, feel free. But this one, we're going to talk about these new things, which is the matrix, okay? And in plural, they're called matrices. And what we're basically doing is just like our synthetic division, we're going to take those two equations, two unknowns, or those three equations, three unknowns, and we're going to get rid of the X, Ys, and Zs. And we're just going to take the coefficients because ultimately that's what it came down to, right? When we were trying to eliminate, we had to get those to be the same. So it's the same type of idea, all right? But you're going to have to learn how to work with these. You're going to have to hopefully realize that these are still just my three equations without the X, Y, and Z and all the ugliness that came with, like long division did, to synthetic division, okay? So if, again, you want to read through that, feel free. But here's some quick notes for you about matrices. Okay, the way that we read these are by row and then column. So same thing we talked about with our equations. And then we look down each column for the X, the Y, and the Z. Same idea. They're going to use capital letters to represent each matrix. All right, and they're going to say it's an M by N for their dimensions. Okay, this is a two by three or a three by two. And again, that's going to talk about the rows versus the columns for those. And in each one of those, they're going to have these things called elements. Right? In each one of those elements, they're going to use subscripts to let you know. This is element. That doesn't mean A12. What that means is row one, column two. That's the coefficient for it. All right, so again, this is going to look a little bit different than what you ever may have seen or learned, but it's all similar to what we just did in the previous two sections. All right, so in order to add these things, subtract them, multiply, we're going to talk about all that stuff. All right, but ultimately, what this is saying, it does not matter what order. 
we're going to have to make sure that we add from matrix A with matrix B. It's going to have to be the same row and the same column to get that new thing they're calling C. All right, so if we're going to take row one, column two, we got to add it to row one, column two to get that new element in that exact spot, row one, column two. Okay, so order doesn't matter. You can add the A and the B or the B and the A. You should get the same thing. Call that the commutative property and also associative property. If I have to add three things, order doesn't matter. You want to do A and B, then C, or B and C, then A. You could even do A and C and then B. Again, order doesn't matter. But what about when we multiply by a real number? When we multiply these matrices by some number? Well, to let you know it's not just a constant, okay? They're going to call it something special. They're going to call it a scalar, right? Still just a constant but it doesn't have these other things that we deal with in physics or trig, right? So if we have some scalar, it's just a number. And if I tell you to multiply matrix A by some number, say three, then what do you think you would do with that three to the entire matrix? What would it make it all? Make it three times as big, everyone. Don't be afraid to be wrong, okay? Because if you are, you'd never get anywhere because you're too afraid to fail. It's just going to take the three, and it's going to distribute it to each and every element, as you can see there. All right, now we just have that C, or three, times each one of our elements. Row one, column one. Row two, column two. Every single one is now multiplied by C. Pretty easy, okay? And again, if we wanted to take that and do it to both, rather than having to write it in front of each, you can write it in front of one. So that still holds true like we've done in the past, right? Whether that's by one thing or by two. A couple different ways to write it. We won't get too heavy into this, but if anybody plans on being a math major, this is something that you can deal with down the road in a class called linear algebra, okay? So here's a quick example. Not even gonna make you do, just wanted to show you what these can look like. If you guys wanna see it, we can try to do it real quick, but there's other things I'd rather get to. What is this saying we are going to do though? Multiply A by five and then subtract it by B times three or negative three. How do we multiply the five times the A? What do we multiply by five? Every single thing is going to be multiplied by five. And then every single thing would be multiplied by three. The only difference that I want to make sure that you guys know how to do is what would we do to subtract? The same numbers in the same positions. Very good. So whatever we end up with, and I'll just do like, let's say the first row. So that'd be negative 25, positive 15, and then 35, right? And then this one would be three times. So negative 24, 18, and 33. And of course, we'd have to do that with every single row for all those matrices, but in order to do the subtraction, I would take this and subtract that, which again, be careful. Remember what happens when you subtract a negative in your life? That's a positive thing. Okay. So a negative times a negative, in other words, it's going to make that positive. So you're going to end up with what? Careful. This is already negative, yeah. right? And then it would become negative plus, one. yeah, just a negative one. So again, I don't want to go through the whole thing, but you guys, I want to make sure you didn't make any 
simple mistakes. What would the next one be? Negative three. Good. The 15 minus the 18. And then 35 minus 33. Positive two. Rinse and repeat. Do the same thing for row two in each and row three in each. Okay. Pretty simple. But what about multiplying? What happens when we're asked to multiply these things? Not just by a scale or a number, but an entire matrix and another. There's a few rules. Okay. And the rules are that the insides of these things, whether we have a two by three or a three by three, that's how we read these, the insides have to be the same. And by the way, whatever's left on the outsides, that's what will be the result. And so just like we did with that scalar, that constant, what did we do when it was a 5A and a 3B? Well, we multiplied that to every piece in there, right? Well, what am I going to do when I'm trying to multiply this by this? Think about distributing a binomial. Let me do something like this. Times another binomial. Well, we took whatever this was and we distributed it to each. And then we took whatever this was and we distributed it to each. And then we showed the cards at the end by combining like terms. Similarly, we're going to take the row of this and we're going to multiply it to the column of this. And that operation is going to give me, remember I told you we're going to end up with a two by three. two rows and three columns, that one operation is going to give me the very first thing. When I do it a second time to the second column, that's row one of this, but column two of this, well, that's exactly what's going to give me that. And again, to the third. That will then give me the third element. What would I do to get the second row? I'd use my second row. And I'd do that to each column to get each element. And that, my friends, is how we multiply matrices. Got it? Of course not. You gotta get your hands dirty. So I wanted to show you what the finished, let me keep the A and the B there what that was looking like without the red ink disappearing. If I took this first row and this first column, I would multiply the A11 and B11. Same position, right? Row one, column one. Then I would add that to the second thing and the second thing. And then I'd add that to the third. In the third. But notice we are adding all of that up. So that times that plus plus will give me just that new row one, column one element. Okay, a little different. So in this class, I know it's going to be a little confusing. We're just going to learn the basics of how to manipulate and use these matrices. When and if you ever get to a higher level math course, like linear algebra, then you'll actually see how and why these are used a little bit more. Okay, we're just going to scratch the surface in this class. So I'm going to leave it at that. And make sure, again, you know that the associative distributive properties work, but this time not commutative. Right? Because if I had a two by three, and I was asking you to multiply it by a three by two, that would work because the insides, right? But if I rearrange that, a three by two, which was, call it B, if I did B times A this time, a three by two, 
this would still be the two by three. And that would work. But if it was a four by three that was being multiplied by a three by two, and now I switched it to be my three by two and the four by three, now it doesn't work. Okay. And if something doesn't work always in math, we say, well, it's not a rule. It's just a special case, right? So that's why we cannot have commutative property when we're multiplying these matrices. You guys wanna do one? Yeah. Okay. I called them C and D, doesn't matter what you call them, right? They'll call them different things, but this is a what by what. What do we always do first? Rows. Yeah, the way you read. Rows and then columns. Okay, left to right, top to bottom. So this would be a... Three by two. Two by three, right? Two rows, three columns. Where this one would be a one, two, three by two. You know, are we okay? Can we multiply these? Yes. And what are we going to end up with? Two by two. Very good. And how do we do it? We take the row of the first thing and we multiply it by the column of the second. And all of those that match up together are gonna just give me the first thing. Then I will do that same thing with that row, but to a new column, which is gonna give me a second. Then I'll do the same thing with the second row to each of those to get the other two in my two by two that we said we'd get. Okay, so let's do it real quick. And then I'll leave part B to you guys if you'd like to. All right, I'm gonna take this row one, which is three, six, four, and I'm gonna roll, uh, excuse me, multiply it times the first column in the other. So I'm gonna take the three times four and add it to the six times negative two and add it to the four times five. Everybody got that? Cool, then let's do it again. But this time, let's do it to this. So I'm still gonna take this first thing, but now I'm gonna multiply it to the second column, which is gonna give me that second row one, column two element. And that would be the first time, uh, excuse me, the first thing times the first thing, which would be three times 10. Normally I just write 30 there, but I wanna show you guys where I'm getting 30, right? And then six times six. And then the third element in each row and column for that. So four times nine. Yeah, Barrett's like, those are getting large. But it's not that difficult, right? What happens when you multiply numbers typically get larger these even more so because you're going to take three things and multiply it to three things and add them all together. Everybody cool there? Well, then let's do it to the second row. So that would be a negative eight times four plus a zero times Happens to be negative two, but it doesn't matter. And then a 12 times a five. And then lastly, I would take and multiply the last column again with that last row. First thing with the first thing, second thing with the second, and third element with the third. 
multiply all those out, add them together, and that would then give you your nice two by two where you have your numbers filled in for each. Not too difficult, but very different than a lot of things we've done in the past. Any questions on that? Okay. Keep on keeping on. Before we get to the last section here for today, as I already mentioned, is it possible to be able to multiply A times B, but not B times A? Yes. Because if the middles are the same, then we're going to end up with a three by two. But if we flip those around, we would no longer have the same middles. Therefore, things would not match up with our elements. And then everything can't be multiplied. All right. So be careful with that. Here's 11.6, which is why we've kind of introduced the matrices. Solving these systems, just like we did earlier, okay, in the previous sections, 11.1, 11.2, and 11.3, whether it was two equations, two unknowns, or three equations, three unknowns, there is this genius kid by the name of Frederick Gauss. He came up with a lot of different types of things, and one of them was how to solve systems using a different technique, these matrices. Okay, so all the stuff that we've been talking about now comes to a head right here. And that's why I left out 11.4 until next week. Okay, that one's kind of an anomaly. It doesn't flow as well as these ones do. Okay, so if you're wondering why, or if you didn't even know, don't worry about it. But that's why I skipped 11.4 till next week. All right, that will be the very last section we cover in this chapter. So you may have heard of Gauss before. German mathematician, he also came up with a lot of different things like sequences and series, how to find the sum of a bunch of numbers. And he discovered it when he was about 10 years old. Yeah, pretty impressive. He was a prodigy, right? What we're going to try to do is take those three equations, three unknowns, or those two equations, two unknowns, and we're going to solve it just like we did with our dividing polynomials and synthetic division rather than long division. We're going to get rid of all the x, y's, and z's, and we're simply going to take the coefficients of them all. Okay? So they call these things augmented matrices. Talk about what that looks like. But here's Gaussian elimination. All right? Notice elimination back into our conversation. Gauss, because it's a special technique, he's going to take all those coefficients for your x, y, and z. And what he's going to try to do is he's going to try to get the diagonal to be ones and everything below it zeros. Because if this column represents your x, y's, and z's for each of our equations that we had, then what does this bottom row tell you? How many X's do you have? How many Y's do you have? How many Z's do you have? And do you remember the secret to math is getting one equation with just one variable? Well, by not using all the stuff that we did in those first couple of sections and examples today with three equations, three unknowns. Now, in the very clean matrix, we're going to be able to get it to look like this, which will tell me exactly how many Zs I have. And once I know the Z, then I can plug it in here and find my Y. And then when I know both of those, I can plug them in here and here to find the X. So the task is still the same. The only difference in what they call this row echelon form is each row and each column represents each row an equation and each column a variable, the x, the y, the z, however many we have. 
And if we can get one of them to be by themselves, then we can plug it in and find the other, plug those in and find the last one. Just like we had done before. Okay. So how to do it and all of that. Again, you can go back, pause this, read through it. But I think the best way to do it is just by a quick example. Right? So notice, this looks familiar, doesn't it? You already know how to do this. We are not learning this new way to do things for this problem. Because there's a much easier way to do that problem. It's by what? Elimination. Just eliminate. You get 5x equals 10. What's x? And if I know x is 2, I'm going to go back to this bottom equation, equation 2, if you will, and I'll put a 2 in there, minus 3y equals negative 1, and I'll solve. What's my answer for y? So my solution to this is to like that. Why would we learn another technique? Well, guys, remember, it is not for a two by two, a two equation, two unknown. It's more for the three by threes or four by fours or five by fives that you could someday see. So even though you don't need this technique, please try to learn it because it will help you in the future. All right, so I'm going to show you Gaussian elimination, even though we already know the answer is 2, 1. So I'm going to start by writing what is called the augmented matrix. And that is get rid of the X's and Y's. Just take the coefficients of this thing. So that means I got a 4. 3, 11 for that first row. Does everybody see it? What would I have in the second row then from my second equation? One negative two negative one. Now, how do I know that this represents an X, Y, and a Z or that it's the X, the Y, and that's the equal to? Well, that's where the augmented part comes in. I want to know where my balance is, where my equation is. And so all we do is we draw a big line to let you know. Here's the one side, here's the other that are equal. Does everybody kind of see the relationship to long division and synthetic division? And this, so far, we just got rid of the X's and Y's and we took all of their coefficients. And what do we say we could do to any equation if we wanted? Anything we want, just like we did earlier. We multiplied, we added, we moved them around like I did from those first two, just to kind of throw you off. I could rewrite these, right? Couldn't I just switch row one, row two? Well, what they want to often know is, well, how did you get this new matrice? Well, all I'm going to do is I'm going to switch row one and row two. And that's how I'm going to let you know I did it. I'm going to take one, negative three, negative one, and put it up top, and four, three, 11, and put it down on the bottom. Because remember, in Gaussian elimination, we want all of the leading coefficients to be one in that diagonal, and everything below them to be zeros. So since this had a one, I just switched row one and row two, because now I got it. So the next thing I want to do is zero out that four. And what would I have to do to get that to be a zero? I would have to take and multiply a negative four times row one and add it to row two to get a new row two. And so that little sentence there in symbols is actually telling or showing them exactly how I got this new matrix. 
And all I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply all this by a negative four. And I'm going to add just like we would have done up here if we were trying to eliminate the x's, right? I would have taken this and multiplied by a negative four and then added it to eliminate that. Guys, we're doing the same thing just without the x's and y's. And again, it's not for this. It's not for a two by two. It's for a three by three or higher. Okay, so that row one is going to stay the same. One negative three, negative one. I didn't change row one. I used row one to add to row two to get a new row two. Okay, and a lot of people that throws them off. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're supposed to have the negative four, 12. No, I wanted this one there. That's why I did the first step and switched these. Okay, but now my new row two is going to be, since this was a negative four and that was a positive four, a zero. That's a positive 12 and three, so 15, and then 15. Is everybody okay where I got these? I multiplied row one by a negative four, and I added it to my row two. Here, here, and here to get a new row two, which was this. And now what do I want to do to that equation two or row two? Still all good with row one. I'm not going to touch that, but I'm going to divide by 15 to row two to get a new row two, which gives me still a zero. But then I get a one. Trial. What's that? Trial. That's strange. All right. So, yeah, just divide everything by 15. And that gives me my column of ones with my zero underneath. And that's it. Again, was all of that worth doing when we can already do it here? No. I'm going to be very honest with you. No, it's not. But it might help us to use this very clean, very organized technique of Gaussian elimination for when there's a three by three or four by four or five by five. Okay, so that's why this was created. But let's make sure that we understand what this found for us. What is this? It is an equation with zero X's, one Y, and it's equal to one, which means I can extract this and say that I have Y equals one. Pretty simple. Now I can go back up to this equation or even my originals and plug it in. And now I know that using the second equation here, row one, I got one X minus three Y equals negative one. And we found our Y to be a one. So I'll add that three over. And as you can see, my X is two just like we found using our old elimination technique. Okay? So of course, that's gonna take some practice. And of course, a three by three is gonna be even harder, right? There's gonna be a lot more moving parts, a lot more matrices that you're gonna be writing out. But feel free to come to my office hours or check out section 11.8, there's even another way. We're not even gonna cover 11.8, but if you're interested in this, you can check it out. There's an alternative technique to solving these systems, okay? So if anybody wants to stick around, I can either do this one, or you can meet me in the office hours a little bit later, all right? You guys have a good one. I'm gonna go ahead and continue on with this so that I have it recorded, but otherwise, sorry to go buzzer to buzzer on this one. There's a lot of information.
Have a great week. All right, with the few people that are still here, I would not have even done what I just did. I tried to stop you before anybody wrote it down, but here's why. I don't want to waste time. I know I'm going to have to do quite a few of these, okay? Why would I have not done that? Does it matter what order they list these equations in? No, as you guys saw in those very first two examples I did, that's all I did. We would have got the same answer whether we use substitution or elimination. And remember with Gaussian elimination, we're trying to get that first thing to be one and then all the way on down and then everything else to wipe out to be zeros. So in my opinion, I'm not even gonna do this. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just rearrange the order and I'm gonna put this one as my first this one as my second and that one as my third in order of ugliness or difficulty, All right? So my first one would be a one, negative one, two, and seven. My second one, a negative one, three, one, and negative two for row two. And then row three, just taking its coefficients, three, two, negative one, negative 10. And now I have that first column, or excuse me, that first row with that first element being a one. From there, the next thing I'm gonna try to do is zero out the things under it. And once I get those to be wiped out, then I'll concentrate on getting this to be a one. And then wiping out this, and then that to be a one. And at that point, I'll have my Z. And once I found my Z, I'll plug it in there so that I could find the Y and then plug those both in there to find the X. Again, it's all about finding that first value, okay? So the good news is I got what I wanted, which means I'm not gonna rearrange or do anything to row one. I'm gonna keep it, but I am gonna use it to do some other things. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply Actually, all I got to do is take row one and row two. I'll start with that to rewrite a new row two. So row one, not changing. Row three, not changing. The only thing I'm changing is row two. And what is the new row two going to look like? Add row one and row two. So that will give me the zero that I was trying to get. I just got to deal with the rest. Everybody good there? Only thing I changed was row two. I'll highlight it there. Now I want to try to get row three's first element to be a zero. How am I going to do that? Three times row one plus row two. Very good, Barrett. That means I am not touching row one or row two. I'm only going to change row three. And how am I gonna do it? Negative three times my row one, and then add that to row three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna write it right underneath. That's gonna be a negative three. That's gonna be a positive three, negative six, and negative 21. So multiplying this whole equation, which we're calling a row now in this form, by a negative three 
and then adding it to row three to get my new one. That will now give me, I'll highlight again, zero, five, negative seven, and negative 31. So far, so good. Again, we got our row one and then zeros underneath. Now I need the next row to be a one. I need that column to be ones and everything underneath zeros. So unfortunately, what's the only thing I can do to that to get it to be a zero, uh, excuse me, a one? Row two plus row one. Okay. Julian, very good. If I take row one and row two and add them, that will definitely make that a one. But then it changes the zero into a one. But then it undoes something that we just did. Very good. So that's the Would tricky part. Multiply row two by one half. Very good. So again, not going to change what I have in row one and not yet changing or touching row three, but in this instance, just dividing everything by two. And you already know that that's trouble, which is why Julian tried to do what he did. He tried to just add row one and row two because he saw that, yeah, these would work out well to be my one that I wanted, but it would get rid of a zero that we earned. So our only option was to either rearrange these and see if dividing by five would work better here, but it wouldn't. So we just said, we'll just divide all of that by two or multiply by a half. So the only thing changing again, zero, one, which is why we're doing all this, three halves, five halves. We'll deal with it when we have to. Very good. What's my next step? Still need a zero and a one on the third row. Good. Before we want to try to make this a one, we got to make everything under the ones that we get zeros, which we did here. Worked out well, but now we got to make this a zero. And how are we going to do that? Can we use row one, Julian? Yes. No. No. Nope. And here's why. You wish, right? Because I don't want to use these. But this and that would, again, undo something that we need and work to get. So unfortunately, we're going to have to use row two to zero out that five. And you know how we're going to do it. It's just you don't want to, right? <laughs> what are we going to have to do? Negative five. negative five to row two, add it to row three to get your new row three. So again, not touching row one, not touching row two, just using it to get a new row three. And that was by multiplying the whole thing by a negative five and then adding it to row three. So that's still going to be a zero, which is why we had to use row two. That's going to be a negative five, which is what we wanted. And then that is going to be negative 15 over two, which we'll have to deal with. And then that is a negative 25 over two, which we'll have to deal with. So what do we get where well, we keep our zero? We get our zero. And then we got to go off to the side and take negative seven and try to subtract 15 halves, which means that I'm just going to have to multiply by that fancy one again to get negative 14 over two and negative 15 over two, which is negative 29 over two. Doing it once more, I got negative 31 minus the 25 over two. Getting my common denominator, negative 62 over two, 
minus 25 over 2, negative 87 over 2. But luckily, we're almost done. Don't have to work with so many fractions. The last thing I want to do is make this a 1. So I get my diagonals and everything below it a 0. So what am I going to have to do to make that a 1? Multiply by negative 2 over 29. Which is called the what? Reciprocal. Very good. Very good. So we will take negative 2 over 29 times row 3 to get a new row 3. And if I take that negative 29 over 2 and multiply it by that negative 2 over 29 that Julian said, and that negative 87 over 2, and multiply by that, that will finally give me what we wanted, which is positive. Two, well, all of that cancels out, which is why we did what we did. So we get our zero, zero. That becomes a one. And then this last one here, positive as well. The twos cancel out. Be really nice if 29 went into 87 evenly, wouldn't it? You guys, remember the estimation stuff we talked about? That's about 30. That's about 90. I'm thinking it's about three. Since I'm missing one three times, you can see there it is. That's awesome. That worked out well. That means we just found what? Z. Zero X's, zero Y's, one Z is equal to three. And how would we find our other stuff, our Y and our X? Plug Z into row two. Good. Use equation or row two now, which says one Y plus three halves of a Z is equal to five halves. Now, if you don't like that one, what you could do if you wanted is just multiply this whole equation by two. But then you'd have two Y's and then you're going to have to undo it eventually. But if you don't want to work with the fractions, you do have that option. Totally up to you. I'll just plug in the three and go to work because I already have a common denominator. So I got y plus nine halves equals five halves, which when I subtract that over, what do I get? Negative four halves, which is just negative two. And finally, now I can go back up to that first row or equation, which said 1x plus 1y, that was minus, sorry, minus 1y plus 2z's equaled seven. And because we now know what Y is, and we knew what Z was, we can finally figure out what X is. And that means we write it as an ordered triple and we put, it's as easy as negative one, negative two, three.